live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Boston, Massachusetts for theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media with my co-founder over here, Dave Vellante of SiliconANGLE Media, which is Wikibon the Cube, SiliconANGLE. Our next guest is Alan Nance, VP of Technology at Royal Phillips, huge conglomerate, international, uh, and a huge company. Obviously you have huge modernization challenges to stay current, stay relevant, a lot of new competition with a lot of legacy. Welcome to theCUBE. Good morning. So we are, we're talking transformation. We, we believe, we've been saying here in theCUBE, we've been talking about the trends, very disruptive. We've been saying, saying things like transforming industries, um, and if you're not evolving, you will be disrupted. That's kind of the thesis that we see. And with this whole new era of born and big data, whole, whole new generational shift that culturally we're seeing with developers, management, everything else. So I got to ask you, how do you see transformation for a large company uh, like yours? What does the technology transformation look like? So when we, so we're in the middle of a, a, a very major uh, technology transformation that uh, affects the end-to-end -end, uh, business processes within Philips. Uh, Philips has for 140 years been a very diverse company of standalone P&Ls, and each of those companies have essentially created their own technology solutions. What we're doing AKA now, AKA silos. Silos. <laughs> so we have multiple SAPs, multiple SRMs, uh, 57 ways of creating an invoice. Now what we're going to do, uh, what we're in the middle of doing, is we're standardizing end-to-end -end processes across all of our businesses, whether they're healthcare, lighting, or consumer lifestyle, uh, around uh, standard uh, idea to market, market to order, order to cash. The technology supporting those is standard. So. Um, our CEO made a statement three years ago that 85% of our IT spend was non-differentiating to Philips in the marketplace. So it makes no sense to have these highly customized uh, Philips systems. So we're replacing all of those systems with standard solutions. So Salesforce.com, um, uh, SAP is still a, a mainstay, uh, Eloqua, and, 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 and all of those types of systems. Uh, Windchill. Underneath that, and that's the, the thing I'm really responsible for, is we're creating a cloud-based common infrastructure and operating platform that supports both the commercial as well as, um, as, well as the enterprise systems of record, systems of insight. And what that is, is basically it's, it's seven cloud services. So data analytics is, is one of those. Uh, connected devices, Internet of Things is one of those. You have the more traditional uh, storage, uh, compute, security, uh, high volume transport network, and then underpinning that is a control plane. And all of those uh, have to be rooted in consumption-based cloud services. Describe, um, I'm just writing all that that's really good. So to explain and define consumption-based infrastructure because there's a reason right. for this. We've been yeah. talking about consumption changing with mobile, cloud, and data. Yeah. New apps are coming, new user experiences, new interfaces across the board from developers to users. So yeah. what is consumption-based infrastructure? Now, uh, it, it has, so I'll tell you how we got there. So we put all of the uh, primary suppliers in a room uh, for four days, separate, four separate day-long sessions. So Amazon, Google, everybody was there. And we said to them, you know, what do you believe consumption-based is? So everybody wrote it down, then everybody got to vote on it, and when they finished the vote, we had a list of 12 things. And we said, okay, uh, everybody agrees on this, now let's go do it. So what is it? It means that there are no startup charges, there are no launching charges, there are no termination charges, and you pay for what you use. So it's, it's, it's really quite revolutionary in that respect because it's the end of the ELA as we know it. Um, so we have now uh, 16 companies that have signed the consumption-based charter, including the ones who are more obvious, like uh, an Amazon was the first to sign, but also Rackspace has signed, Dimension Data has signed, HP, IBM. 
Uh, Microsoft has signed is it, a, is, it, is it actually a terms of service or SLA? Is it more like a bill of rights or like a philosophy culture? I'm buying into the fraternity yeah. checking. Yeah. Yeah. Sign a set my, of parameters you know, yeah. that the uh, vendors <laughs> have to live up to. Yes. Yeah, the it's, blood it's, is in blood too. It's like. all of those things. Well, so that's down, down to the enforcement. You're yeah. absolutely right. It started off as a charter, a principal charter, and also uh, because of uh, you know antitrust stuff, you've got to you've got to be careful about saying this is the only way you can do business with us. Yeah. But we have made it very clear: if you cannot provide a consumption-based arrangement with us, you will not be primarily considered. So we do have one uh, one vendor uh, with three acronyms, uh, begin with an S, who can't find their way to signing it. And so we've told them that then the only way you can do business with us is through one of the people that are signing it. So we have our first consumption-based uh, SAP system, which is being provided to us through uh, another supplier. So, so in yeah. theory, they could sell through Amazon or something like yeah, that. In, uh, theory. in this so, case, it's through Atos. But yes. Through Atos. Okay. Yeah. So, so great. Yeah. And now, uh, is so, uh, is your yeah. private, you know, cloud, your on-premise team, participating yeah. in this yeah. bill of rights, or is it all Everybody, externally sourced? We, uh, yeah, fundamentally, our legacy systems are in um, in in private clouds. Yeah. So. They're already in there, but for everything that is new in the new setup for the transformation of Philips, those things will all be based on, on this. So, what do you envision? Uh, that increasingly the spend is going to go toward this yes. sort of external sourcing? Yes. So you're doing the big switch. Yes, and, and not only that, what we also want to be able to do is take our current fixed budgets that have a chargeback mechanism and make them consumption directly to the business. And the, and the impetus was to get rid of that, what you called, your CEO called uh, non-differentiated IT spend. Exactly right. And uh, exactly so, right. uh, this is fascinating. So <laughs> Dave, this is back to the people process technology transformation. Yes. So like, you know, consumption based, buy by the drink, however you oh. want to do, that seems to be the model. Yeah. Um, how has it gone over internally as you go through the business units? Was there change involved? Do people have to be slapped around and put in line? <laughs> I mean, how do you do it in, in, the, in, the, in a yeah. Dutch company? I mean, yeah. well, do you get them in a headlock and say, yeah. you're doing it? I mean, what do you we do? know how we do it on the East Coast. <laughs> so yeah. How do you do it? <laughs> well, I tell you, if you, if you know anything about Dutch companies, they're very um, consensus driven. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of talking around this stuff. Um, the biggest challenges for us in terms of process and, and the way people look at it has been in procurement, legal, and, uh, and compliance and things like that because when you do away with RFPs, because basically what you do is everything is pre-contracted, and so you, you don't have a commitment. So, for instance, for procurement, they, the, the RFP process goes out the window, so how do you ensure contestability? Big, big uh, challenge for them. Uh, in the same way, finance, I mean, I'll give you an example. Finance is used for us to coming in with an approval that says this is the investment, you know, this is the capex, this is depreciation, and now they get a form from me that says zero, 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 zero. And they say, well, how can we approve this? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, it's your form. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> so there, there is a mindset change to go down this route. Also the suppliers, even the suppliers who are bought into this also have to do some work back at the base. Uh, you know, we've got to be honest about it. So, you know, I know that, with, for instance, IBM and HP who have more traditional business models than an Amazon, you know, th there's some work that needs to be done, but everybody's stepping up and, um, We've got the first contracts in place. As I said, we've got uh, our product lifecycle management running on Amazon. We've got uh, uh, we've got um, our order to cash running on uh, on SAP as a service. Uh, uh, so it, it's happening now. And, and the bit, talk about the business case. Yeah. Uh, was the primary metric to shift that 85 percent? Was it to save money? Was it to improve agility? I wonder if you could talk about that. Agility is the big thing. This is not a cost saving exercise. This is about time to revenue. So, uh, you know, I think Dave said just now, the biggest, the biggest challenge that we have is uh, the markets are very, very competitive. Uh, the turnover in products is very fast. There's also a race, if you look at the internet of things, where Philips is a big player because of our consumer lifestyle healthcare uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. So getting stuff out to the marketplace is incredibly important. Now, technology is part of it. But also, you can't underestimate the compliance cycles that we have to run through, especially in the healthcare industry. Um, so the faster we can provision, the faster we can dial up and dial down, uh, the better it is. There's also a second thing in agility, and that is we are finding lots of companies that didn't exist three years ago, four years ago, are now critical in some of our value propositions. So you want to be able to add them and take them away in the same way. And you also want to be able to say, okay, we're no longer going to do this, we're now going to do that without long-term termination uh, clauses. So the 85% was the catalyst. Yes. Uh, it's not necessarily the metric is basically saying, why are we doing this? Let's right. let's basically go to the cloud. Time to revenue, I think, is the most, most important driver for us. 
So talk about the compliance and the security yeah. edicts because you know, Amazon's got yeah. great security, Google's got great security, Rackspace has great security, but they're all different. So how do you right. rationalize that? So there are various initiatives that we're looking at right now because if you look at most of my colleagues in the, in the industry, they have point-to-point -point connections to the cloud. Uh, we're also trying to look from cloud to cloud connections. So we've created a concept which is called Interdomain Connect in which we put nucleuses in the clouds of the suppliers as like traffic cops for us. Uh, but security is, is, is still a, a major issue um, because a lot of the cloud suppliers haven't looked at security or compliance from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the large players are what I would call domestic offshore players. They have all their data centers for in the United States. And then you run into issues around privacy, data restrictions in Russia, Germany, France, where data can't be stored anywhere other than in those countries. So those are challenges uh, that we need to, to look at. And sometimes I find that some of, the, some of the smaller, even though they're big names, the smaller players in the United States do not understand the complexity of, of, of this going forward. John, you remember we talked to the head of security at, at Amazon and yeah. we pushed him on this. Right. And Germany, we used Germany as a specific example. Yeah. He said, well, we have a data center in Ireland. He right. said, it's inside the EU yeah. and that you know, basically complies. We said, has right. that been tested in a court of law? He said, no. no. What do well, you think? I, I mean, as an example, I don't I, want to pick on Amazon. No, no, but, no, but I think but Amazon is, yeah. I, I, so here's the challenge for us, though, is we, we do not believe over time that, the, that having one data center in the EU is going to be sustainable. I, uh, we also don't want to go to having you know, 153 data centers in, all around the world either. So one of the things that we do in the SIOP model is, is try to portion things out. So who does have a data center that can store that in right. Germany or in France? Um, so for Amazon, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a very big challenge. But for Salesforce.com, it's a big challenge as well. Um, and I think it's getting worse because because of you know all the discussions around the NSA and you know there's a there's a there's a feeding frenzy on the concerns, and you saw I mean like only four weeks ago Russia passed legislation that said you know no data about uh, companies or private persons can uh, can move out of Russia. Right. So what are we going to do? Is Amazon going to put a data center in Russia, or or is there some other way that we can meet that need through a storage cloud, um, and still do compute somewhere else or so, and also depends on every, every country's uh, rules are slightly different. So for, for instance, for Germany, looking at something from outside of Germany counts as being outside of Germany. So it's, it's, it's a complicated... So it's uh, all the domicile game. issues, and it's, yeah. I'm sure there'll be all kinds of circumvention and yeah. uh, rules to get around it. But I gotta, on, yeah. on that thread, I got to ask about open source. In your, yeah. your principle-based contract of consumption infrastructure, how does yeah. open source play into all this? Well, we are looking, for instance, China right now, we're looking at CDH. Um, personally, I would like to focus on Haven because I, I, I think if I look at Hadoop and some of these uh, open source things, the, the, their security is not, not rigid enough for a lot of the applications that you want to use. There are lots of things we can do that do not require that. But I think we'd rather look to a company like uh, HP uh, because they, they, they understand the entire enterprise. And they're global. And they're global. And they have a great global footprint. And they have a great global footprint, uh, as does obviously IBM and others. But I think right now HP definitely has the edge in terms of the Haven capability and certainly the Vertica suite. Yeah, and Dave, this is something we talked about, the global yeah. footprint we were talking on. Uh, I was talking with um, the CEO of EMC, Joe Tucci, yeah. Mark Andreessen, and uh, David Dwell FireEye with the a VMware event. And yeah. The growth internationally is a massive opportunity for U.S.-based companies. Yeah. Now, with, with this, certainly the Asia market, and then Europe obviously is still growing, the challenges though are unique. This is an issue that's going to be coming up significantly. It's the here. number one thing. I think security and compliance are going to be the biggest uh, drawbacks for, for the further expansion. Now, I would also say that Philips, I mean, I was on a call with McKinsey and a whole bunch of banks um, you know, I don't, I don't think every industry is going to be able to do what we're trying to do. I think the industries that are going to follow us are going to be Internet of Things based industries that mm -hmm. have, have this need. I don't think the banks are going to go down this route. Uh, so I think it's going to be per industry. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be the companies that are in manufacturing have complicated supply chains that are going to benefit most of this. So you're essentially building a set of, of infrastructure services uh, mm -hmm. that you can offer to the business that aligns uh, the, whether it's the edicts of the local domicile right. or the business needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed. How do you 
deal with the possibility that you're just creating a set of stovepipe cloud services? <laughs> I, I, I don't think we are because you know, there are, in these, uh, there are in these seven things. What the business does with them, that's where the differentiation has to occur. So, uh, and of, of course, Philips has the edict to do things end to end. So, there's, it's, so it's not like, you know, I, I was uh, talking to somebody the other day about a friend of mine who's doing a big project in a bank, and, and I was saying to McKinsey, so, you know, what's the difference between what he's doing and what we're doing? And he said, look, here's the difference. Your exco is saying we're going to do this. You're being driven down, and the only question you get is why are you not ready? <laughs> Whereas in the bank, this guy's got an idea, <laughs> yeah, right. and he's trying to sell it. And, and so we, there's a big push top down to have enterprise, reusability, common platforms. And so that will avoid us getting the, the, the stovepipes in my mind. The other thing too, David, we talk about, you know, and here I'm in, Cal I'm in Palo Alto in California, mm -hmm. we love Chipotle, and it's basically a franchise, if you know Chipotle, but it's, it's the same in every location, but right. they don't make their own knives, they don't make their own accessories, no. but the format is standardized. So yeah. the thing that's interesting about what you're doing is, so the stovepipe question is, if you're standardizing, is it, are they stovepipes? Right. Or are they just unique elements to an overall standard system like a Chipotle? It looks right, the so same, the, the but yet... for course kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so what, and, what's your and, take and on that? Is, that? is that the key thing, standardization? Well, contestability is also a big thing, right? So you could argue there, that we are moving towards uh, certain internet exchanges uh, around storage, for instance. So if, you like, if I look at uh, what we call box and store archiving service, whether I get that from uh, Azure or whether I get that from Amazon, it, it is almost a price issue. Um, so yes, there are things that are so commoditized it doesn't matter, um, and you want to have the flexibility. But I, I don't see it, on, on, and also you're going to have certain applications that only run in certain environments because of compliance or what they do. And, and well, standard is actually not a bad yeah. thing. In the franchise yeah. example, it's the operating system, yes. if that works, that's yeah. the critical standardization. Yeah. How they do it day to day, yeah. that's the consumption piece, right? So, or their deployment. Um, but it's also a, a supply chain thing, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. also, so, so basically you're, you're, you're right that what you're doing is you're, you're sourcing through the supply chain. So your, your efforts move from the individual activity to the overall supply chain. That's the crucial thing in the platform. How do I do the, the monitoring? How do, I, how do I control the platform becomes a big issue. So your, your analytics as a yeah. service includes Vertica, is that right? Is that uh, part of why you're We're in the middle of those conversations. So, so not yet? So we are, we are running right now, we're running a number of very, very interesting proof of concepts. Um, we believe that Vertica has the head start Although there are alternatives, you know, Pivotal is, a, is an alternative, right. Amazon is, has an alternative, it's a lot more work for us. Um, and I think that the, the analytics platform is absolutely going to play a role in Philips, uh, the, the vertical yeah, analytics platform. And it's going to be workload dependent. So I've got to ask yeah. you a question, obviously, I love the, uh, the, the international perspective because this is actually the future, right? Globalization yeah. is a reality and I think you guys are yeah. at the front end of, right. of, a, of a tsunami of, of, of transformation in the industry. So right. advice for the vendors out there. You mentioned obviously HP is the global footprint, IBM yeah. and others, and EMC. Yeah. Pivotal doesn't really have a global footprint, but they could say through EMC, whatever, right. yeah, um, the federation VMware, that they have. Yeah. Amazon certainly, is, we love Amazon and yeah. everything else. What's your advice to the startups out there that are coming out, yeah. that are like uh, pre-IPO, like the cloud eras, yeah. that just don't have it yet internationally that are racing to build out. Are they ready? What's your advice to the HPs? What is the global requirement of the future? If you could share some tidbits to those guys. In terms That's of a tough like question. So first of all, I, I do think the United States market is, is, is very significant and huge and you can be very successful without trying to internationalize. And I would say be very careful about your internationalization plans because you can spin your wheels a lot. Uh, it, it, it sucks up money, so you've got to really either follow a client or have a very, very clear targeted strategy because it does require deep local knowledge. Now, you mentioned I, IBM and HP. You're absolutely right. Both of those have a very strong global footprint. It doesn't mean they always act as global companies, though. So a great example is when right. I go to China. So I'm going to China tomorrow because we're, we're trying to onboard uh, Ali Win, the, the, uh, the Chinese AWS huge cultural 
things, huge cultural things. They're, they're very willing, they want to be part of us. Uh, there's lots of commercial reasons why we want to work together, but there's fundamentally things they don't understand. So nobody speaks English at a certain <laughs> level. So getting contracts in place is tough. Talking about compliance regimes is tough. Um, so, but I do think if you really want to be global, you're going to have to have a global footprint, at least I would say in the major countries like China, like Germany. Um, so not Ireland, because I think, I think Ireland has been our default for all sorts of reasons, tax reasons and others. But I think if you look at where the, the, the crux of the legislation, it, it is Germany. Germany is the role model and not Ireland for that. So yes, that's that's how I would go at it. I'm just fans from tweets there. I think you know that's yep. a good challenge. Follow a client. It sucks yep. money. I've seen companies come and go with the international yep. strategy. They just they think they can throw money at it, but it's actually like not just double. The old yep. swag as a startup is that's your budget. Just double it. That's a good swag. But not, <laughs> well, not international. It seems to be yeah. 10x maybe right. if you make a misstep. Well, and also the it, it's non-scalable investment, right? So so most of these startups are highly scalable, there's like 10 people and they have a huge business that they run. That's not possible when you go down a globalization route like this. You have to have specialist people in the country that understand it, so it's non-scalable investment as well. Alan, I have to ask you, yeah. so if you think about the list of vendors that you manage, it's enormous. Yeah. Um, what percent <laughs> get this initiative and are really buying into it? It's, it's, I know it's not 100%. I can, I can almost envision a lot of the guys saying, eh, yeah, well, is you know renew them or keep bumping along with the, some of the legacy stuff? Do, do you? I mean, you're serious <laughs> about this. This is not an experiment. This is no, this serious. is the future of how you're going to do business yeah. with Philips. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, there are companies who I think signed up because it's Philips and they they don't want to not be on the list, mm -hmm. and so they've. Uh, but but I will tell you that one of the companies, I'll give you an example, they signed up, said, yeah, we're totally into this, and then they sent us a proposal that had four pages of termination clauses. Yeah. And so we sent it back and said, ah, you've got to get with the program. And to be <laughs> honest, they did. They've turned it around, not just for us, but they've turned it around into a one-page document. They took out the termination clauses. So I think they're, they're busy, because I think a lot of suppliers feel that this is a way forward. This is a, this is a, a very strong business opportunity for them if they get this right. It will help them uh, go global. And I think other companies are watching us to see if we can pull this off in the way we, we intend to. And if we do, I think you're going to get more people asking for this. So a firm that is not, as John likes the term, yeah. born in the cloud, so a firm that is you know, sort of yeah. primarily on-premise, yeah. um, their play is they've got a partner with somebody yeah. who's got that cloud offering. Is yeah. that right? Yes. And they've got to distribute their software, for example, through that, yes. that partner or their hardware through that part? Well, so I'm not interested in the hardware at all, right? Because because now I, I am totally devoid of that. So you're I, not I, buying hardware anymore. I don't buy anything. Right. So you're there's no investment, MIPS, no capex. You're not buying gigabytes. No, no, no. no well, now, you, in you, certain you, storage things you are, right? But, well, but we're not dictating, even though we can through our soft layer contracts, we can you know dictate bare metal, but basically we're buying services. Right. This is, this is awesome. So this is going to be a great experiment, but the consumption-based infrastructure, Dave, is very relevant, and I think that is going to be an interesting thing to see who will jump on that bandwagon. So did you model this after, I mean, have you, do you peers that have done this? Do you have a, a mental model? Are you guys breaking new ground here? I, I think we're breaking new ground. Um, not, not because we want to, but we, we, you know, we, we've talked to all the people, the usual suspects, and nobody had a model. Yeah. Nobody had anything that could help us. Uh, so we work with a, a very uh, a niche uh, boutique company called uh, Virtual Clarity, and and not and they helped us mo mostly because of the people there who helped us. It's been a lot of brainstorming with people. It, it's uh, I, I'd love to tell you we get it all figured out. And I'd even love to today, get the notes in the meeting when you asked uh, yeah. Amazon, Google to put up their version of yeah. consumption-based infrastructure. I mean that would be great content. Yeah. I mean, well, but it's easier yeah. for those guys, right? I mean, they so Amazon wasn't the problem. I mean, I tell you, the the big one for me was Microsoft, and yeah, that had I'll to bet. go all the way up the chain to get that signed off. Yeah, I mean, for them not because they're in the an LA, they're in the LA, LA shop. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> now, do you think you know Microsoft pre Nadella, Microsoft post Nadella is sort of a different mindset? Yes, or? I I I actually see a huge difference. Although when you when you float down to the commercial teams, still a lot of people make their money on, on the ELA sales model, which is an easy sales model for a salesperson. Um, so even though you know the CEO may support this activity, 
what you're going to find is that there are people in the in the field trying to sell it that yeah, it's, it blows their mind away. So I want to ask you a question about uh, some things we've been talking about since you're here. This is awesome, yeah. awesome content. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming on. Appreciate it. Interface is everything. We heard that quote on, on the cube. Yep. That's more about how people interface, whether it's developer to end user. Uh, growth hacking, which is a term used in this, this new model. Mm -hmm. But since you're going to cloud, I got to ask you about DevOps. DevOps has been a movement that certainly has been the poster child for the Amazon model. Right. Facebook growth came from vertically integrating from an, from an app down yep. to the bare metal. In their case, they're hosting their own stuff. Um, um, but now we're, and that was kind of like a unique mm -hmm. you know, person. Now it's got a negative connotation as we were discussing because what's more important, dev or ops? Facebook's model used to be move fast, break stuff. Yep. Now it's move fast, be reliable. So they've changed their ethos to to move away from that, it's not cool to break stuff if you're in right. a large company. Right. So what's your take on DevOps? What is that role? Is it cloud ops? Is it engineering? Is, is it a revolution? Well, I, so, so I, got, I take a step back and, and I, I never liked the word DevOps because I've been around too long and, and <laughs> sort of you, it inspired, it's just like agile. If you overuse the word agile, you get chaos. I do think that continuous delivery though is, is the right way to go. But again, I would say that depends on the model that you're uh, pursuing. So I'll give you an example, and I think somebody else told me this. Um, consumers do not do well with a new car every week. So if you bought buy a car at the end of the year because you want the new model, you don't want to hear that somebody had a totally different car in January or February or March or April. So I think when we look at DevOps, it also has to be suitable for the consumption uh, of the business that, that's doing it. Uh, lots of businesses have a cycle where they have to have product introduction, but I do think the continuous, if it's about continuous delivery, I think that is going to stay. I certainly get gas every week, so that could be software. <laughs> so let's, get the, let's go into um, continuous delivery. Software seems to be the, the common thing. Yes. We heard infrastructure as code. Um, Mark Andreessen wrote that article about software yeah. eating the world. Do you buy that, and how yeah. instrumental is the software equation? If, first of all, we agree with you on DevOps. We think that's going to yeah. change the definition, but it's about engineering or continuous yeah. delivery. Yeah. But software seems to be the key common yeah. thread. Do you agree? Yeah. I do. And what we're doing in Philips is we're taking things like the agile concept and putting them into the business. Because the other side of this is I think DevOps has been seen as an IT thing, just like agile has and scrums have. And what we're finding is we, we actually put them into the businesses when they're creating products. So we have something called the digital accelerator and we bring in agile teams that, uh, that do exactly what we would normally do in an IT environment, but they do it to get a product out. So the uh, connected air purifier that we're launching in China is the direct result of an agile continuous delivery uh, with the business, not with IT. Alan Nance, VP of Technology at Royal Phillips. Great to have you on theCUBE. I'll give you the last word in, in this segment. Uh, great content. What is your preferred outcome in all this? Let's just go, let's go right to the finish line. Okay, yeah. If all the things fall into place, if you pull the string and everything happens the way yeah. you'd like, what is the outcome that you see happening here? I think the biggest thing for us will be uh, uh, synchronicity with, uh, with, with the revenue. So I think um, the idea is that we get closer to, to the business. So the, the, ed, the ebb and flow of products, the ebb and flow of cost, mirrors the, the revenue of the company. And I think that has to be a very one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's not today, it's completely different cycles. But I think if we time our releases, our upgrades, and our costs in, in line with the revenue of the business, I think that would be a great outcome. Synchronicity, orchestration, these are buzzwords that are coming Absolutely. out of this, right? Absolutely, and orchestration is essential. There are two things that are absolutely essential here, and that's orchestration and, and network. Alan, great interview. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. I know you got to catch a flight to China, uh, <laughs> off, off traveling the world, getting things lined up over there. Uh, four pages of termination clause, like it just, what a nightmare. Uh, I love this commentary. Uh, Alan Nance, great to have you on theCUBE. We'll be right back here, live in Boston, Massachusetts, here at the Big Data Conference. We'll be right back. That was fantastic.